arrived into the system. Attendees. Oh my goodness. Look at all the people who have joined us. <laughs> There's 20, 30, 32, 33. <laughs> So I can already see from the names that we're getting people from different countries, right? Do I see that we have some people from Paraguay, some people from Porto Alegre, Argentina, Pernambuco. So it's, we're, we're getting a group, a pretty broad group of people from different places. Okay, um, well, welcome to everyone uh, who's joining us. We're really delighted for everyone to be here for uh, the the, the online and what, we, what we, we've been hosting since April, online seminars in the Department of Political Science at the University of Sao Paulo on COVID, trying to understand the pandemic from different perspectives. And today, we're really delighted to have uh, a wonderful panel uh, joining us um, to talk about Latin America and to talk about Latin America from uh, the perspective of thinking about the politics, the economics, and the public health challenges. Um, and so um, we've invited for the talk, for, for the talk, and we really want to thank, uh, first of all, start by saying that this seminar is jointly sponsored by the University of Sao Paulo and the Center for Inter-American Policy and Research at Tulane University. So we really, uh, a strong thank you to Tulane University for collaborating with us and allowing this uh, seminar to take place. And I wanna start by just briefly introducing our panel. Uh, all of the people who are joining us have, uh, if I read their biographies, it would take a long time and we wanna get to the talk. So I'm just gonna briefly introduce uh, who they are and, and welcome them. And I'm gonna also introduce them in the order that they're gonna be speaking. Uh, so Arachu Castro is the Samuel D. Stone Endowed Chair of Public Health in Latin America at Tulane University. Um, we're also happy to have Nora Lustig, the Samuel uh, D. Stone Professor of Latin American Economics and the Director of the Commitment to Equity Institute at Tulane. And Joe Tolkien, who is the former Director of the Latin American Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center and currently a Senior Scholar at the Wilson Center. So we're really, really delighted to have the three of you here. And we're very much looking forward to your comments and, and to, the, to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Aratu, uh, we'll start with you, correct? Thank you. Good afternoon. Let me share my screen. I'm going to present some of the estimated impact of the pandemic on maternal and child health in some, several countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, what I'm presenting is work in progress, like everyone who's ever uh, doing research on COVID-19. And uh, I, um, there are, I, I've been in touch with colleagues from uh, the region, from different countries. I've done a questionnaire. And uh, most of the people who work in the healthcare system are talking about the collapse of um, the primary healthcare infrastructure, the collapse of hospitals, the lack of guidance. Some countries have published guidance to health providers and to the population about how to either provide care or get organized or seek care. But uh, that's been, um, from what I'm hearing in different countries, it's mostly guidance on paper, but not necessarily about how to implement the guidance. So there's, there has been a lot of confusion. There's also fear from the population to seek healthcare and fear from health providers to, to treat people who may have COVID-19. So there's been a mixture of um, of events that have um, really damaged a lot of the care that was already in several countries of um, of a, a quality that we could you know not necessarily optimal and um, there are um, what I have, I, I'm assuming also is that in countries that have strong primary healthcare systems 
the impact of the pandemic has been to a lesser extent. And uh, for example, uh, Cuba and Costa Rica, which have very strong healthcare systems, primary healthcare systems, they have um, been able to contain the impact of the pandemic much better than in some other countries. So here I am using a model that was published and was already very, has been already very influential, was published in The Lancet by a team from Johns Hopkins. And they modeled um, what the impact on the coverage of healthcare services would mean for maternal child mortality. And in their model, they, um, they looked at the provision of health services which includes both health workforce and the supplies and equipment and the utilization of health services. So both the demand and access. Um, in access to healthcare services, for example, it could be uh, that the population is afraid of going to a hospital for um, afraid of becoming infected, or it could be that there is no public transportation available or that um, they are afraid of actually going in public transportation. There could be also a, a variety of reasons and it's different in throughout the region. But as always, the impact on access to healthcare will always be more difficult for those who live in poverty compared to the wealthiest groups. So in these uh, modeling assumptions, they considered a small decrease in coverage when uh, it was 5%. It, the scenario number two is that it was a moderate with decrease, it was 10%. And scenario three, a large decrease was 25%. They also um, included in the estimation of child mortality, the increase in wasting, which is low weight for, uh, for, for height. And uh, those were estimated at 10, 20, and 50%. And the, the concern about increase in wasting is, of course, due to the uh, impact on access to food during the uh, lockdowns. And um, so that um, both healthcare coverage and the potential increase in wasting were computed in their modeling assumptions. And um, this is the model that they've used. Actually, it's very sophisticated. And in their website, you have the address here on the right. Um, if you, you can click on, this, on these boxes and it, it, it give, gives you more um, detail about what, what each of these boxes are. But uh, they have included um, data sets from around the world. And then they have this um, formula to determine how, for example, an increase in family planning, which is in the left, may uh, change the risk of fertility and, on, and also on birth outcomes, and that may have an effect on neonatal mortality, for example. So it's a very sophisticated, I'm actually very glad they did it. And um, it's in a program called Spectrum, that um, I'm trying to learn how to use. But in the meantime, what I've done is that I've used the, the annex to the publication in the Lancet, which has data, and I have extracted that data and uh, I've used it to, to create additional estimates. So here, uh, I have based on both the article in the Lancet and UNICEF data from the state of the children, the, um, the latest report from 2020, I have uh, estimated, oh, here I, I see that the, um, well, the series one actually in green is the maternal, the number of maternal deaths per year if the pandemic had not happened. In yellow, would be if there is a decrease in healthcare, in the coverage of healthcare by 5%. Um, and uh, the number, the, the orange is the moderate uh, reduction and uh, red is if there is a large reduction in healthcare coverage. So uh, on the left, we have the countries 
where already there are few maternal deaths every year. And uh, as you move to the right, those are the countries where there are a larger number of maternal deaths and uh, there's usually a higher increase in those countries already, which makes a lot of sense because if there are more maternal deaths, well here um, it's the number, so it's also, we need to take into account the population size. But let me go to the next, um, to the next slide. And um, here is different. This is the maternal mort mortality ratio. The maternal mortality ratio is the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 life births. And um, <coughs> the green uh, circles indicate, as I did, as it did before, the current maternal mortality ratio, well, the, the maternal mortality ratio before the pandemic. And as coverage decreases, it uh, becomes yellow, orange, or red. So red would be with a 25% decrease in coverage. And uh, for example, we have the case of um, the Dominican Republic where the green ball indicates that the ratio is estimated at around 100%. And if there is a decrease in 25% of coverage, it could become, the maternal mortality ratio could be around 230. So we see a very large decrease. And um, in the Dominican Republic, in, when the lockdown measurements were set up, about 40% of the hospitals were dedicated to people with COVID-19. And uh, there was um, no clear guidance for, for people who were pregnant as to where they had to go to, to, to give birth. This is uh, in a country where 99% of births happen in a hospital. So if the estimation of the reduction in coverage of 25% more than doubles the maternal mortality ratio. Imagine if the reduction actually was even greater, which is, could have been the case. Um, we have other countries, well, Haiti has the highest maternal mortality ratio out of these countries. The reason I, I've chosen these countries, uh, there are countries such as Chile or Uruguay missing, but those were not included in the Lancet paper. But um, for example, in Haiti, this, the maternal mortality ratio, could, it's already very high and uh, in, in near 500 and it could go up to 600, which is extremely high. When we look at the number of deaths, here we see in green that this is the, the base, baseline data. And uh, this is the number of uh, deaths in children under the age of five, so from birth to the day before they turn five. And uh, for example, in Brazil, currently, there are more than 40,000 children under five who die every year. And uh, if the reduction in healthcare coverage is um, high of, of 25%, this could, uh, the number of deaths could go up to around 75,000. So in Brazil, of course, it's a very large country, um, and there are, but I want to show the number of children who could be died as a, uh, an excess as a result of the pandemic. And uh, here I'm looking at, I'm showing the under five mortality rate. Um, it's calculated with a very different denominator than the maternal mortality ratio because this is the number of children who die per 1,000 life births. The denominator changes because there are many more children who die under the age of five than of maternal mortality cases. And um, the data in the Lancet included under five mortality, it did, um, but I like also to clarify that what contributes the most to every country to the mortality, the, the child mortality rate is the neonatal mortality rate. And neonatal 
means the first month of life. And um, the impact of the pandemic, I'm expecting it's going to be particularly greater during the neonatal phase. And after the uh, first month of life, it could be uh, due to it can be due to an increase in diarrhea, pneumonia, wasting, etc. But the neonatal mortality rate is the one that it's most difficult to decrease in normal circumstances, and um, in uh, with the current situation, it unfortunately certainly has increased dramatically. So here, for example, we see that uh, Cuba on the left has the lowest under five mortality rate in this set of countries and actually the lowest in the Americas and uh, followed by Costa Rica. And those are the countries that would be least affected. Also in Cuba, the primary healthcare system is strong and there has not been a disruption to the care for women and children during the pandemic. But we see, for example, countries such as, well, here Nicaragua is included, even though Nicaragua is not reporting um, too many, um, too much data about the pandemic. But here another, we see on the right, Dominican Republic that I mentioned earlier also, right now the under five mortality rate is almost 30 and it could go up to more than 50. So really uh, clearly a great impact. Um, if there is, so what I have done in this graph is that I've calculated the maternal mortality ratio in since 2000. So in 2000, 2010, 2017, and in 2020, if there were a 5% reduction in healthcare coverage. So we see that in most countries, the maternal mortality ratio has decreased from 2000, between 2000 and 2017. And in some, in some countries, for example, if we look at Peru, the advances in the reduction in maternal mortality, in the maternal mortality ratio uh, could actually be reversed to levels greater than in 2010 with a 5% reduction in healthcare coverage. So only a 5% could mean that there's a reversal of about 10 years of what has been gained in the reduction of maternal mortality in the case of Peru. Um, in, um, in, if we look at Bolivia, for example, there's been a sharp reduction between 2000 and 2010 but again, there would be an increase of maternal, the, maternal, the MMR uh, with a 5% reduction of healthcare coverage. And here um, I'm showing a similar graph, but with scenario three, which is a 25% reduction of healthcare coverage. And this is where we see that, for example, some of the countries that are very stunning are Ecuador, which um, it's, um, the, the impact of a 25% reduction in healthcare could really set the, the indicator um, to an unbelievable level, never that haven't been recorded before. If we look at the Dominican Republic, for example, the, it, um, the maternal mortality ratio could uh, more than double from um, around 100 to more than 200. And uh, for example, if we look at Bolivia, the uh, maternal mortality ratio could go to levels that correspond to uh, between 2000 and 2010. So clearly the impact could reverse a lot of the gains that many countries have achieved, uh, particularly when they set goals to reduce maternal mortality by year 2015. Not all the countries uh, were able to reduce, to achieve their targets, but clearly with this pandemic and uh, the impact on healthcare coverage, the, um, the, the indicators in maternal and child health could be disaster. They could be really a disaster. So thank you very much. Thank you, Arachu. Um, so we're gonna turn to Nora. <clears throat> Yes, thank you very much, uh, 
Lorena, thanks to the University of Sao Paulo, and uh, Cyper, who I think is a co-host of this. Yes. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with uh, my good friends. Mm -hmm. And ha I hadn't seen Joe Tolton in a very, very long time, so pleasure to see you, even if it's at the distance. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the economic and uh, social impact of uh, what we're experiencing, and I think when you have a pandemic, you probably want to think about three types of impact, and Latin America is being hit by two. Uh, well, actually, most of the countries are being hit by, by two, because this is a pandemic that, uh, different from what happened in 1918, does not affect so much people who are in working age. So the supply of labor has not really been affected uh, by uh, uh, the pandemic, only marginally so. However, because countries have uh, implemented a series of policies to contain the spread of the virus, what people have called putting the economies in a coma and in a loose coma, that's one of the first negative shocks you have on the economies because you're actually shutting down uh, large sectors of, uh, of economic activity, the ones that so-called non-essentials. And in addition to that, you have those that even if they're not uh, essential, if they cannot non essential, if they cannot be performed remotely, often they cannot be implemented at all. So that's one of the shocks. However, Latin America is being hit by another huge shock. And I would say that so far I have not seen, maybe some people have already <laughs> doing, done it, but or calculating it, I'm sure. The second shock is the economic shock per se, which stems from the fact of the reduction in economic activity in the main economic partners globally. So if China slows down as it is slowing down very dramatically this year, this is going to affect primarily the terms of trade and many of our countries are very dependent on commodity exports. So that's a very severe shock. Another shock comes from uh, the countries that are integrated to the US, uh, for example, Mexico, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, that their exports are tied to the US, the fact that the US is reducing its um, economic activity so much is having an impact on uh, countries that are uh, fairly integrated with the US. The others who are less also are hit, but the terms of trade shock is probably the predominant one. The third channel is tourism, because it's one of the industries that gets uh, clobbered the most at this point as a result of the confinement policies. And even if you didn't have confinement policies, I'm sure that the reduction in demand for traveling and visiting places uh, is, it would shrink regardless. And fourth is remittances, which uh, <clears throat> We haven't seen the full-fledged effect yet because, you know, initially, apparently, for example, for Mexico, actually remittances increased, but people are thinking it's primarily because they're sending their, uh, their savings back, anticipating that they may have to go back. But it's expected that as economic activity falls in, in the U.S., primarily, for example, Mexico and Central America got hit the migrants <clears throat> that are living uh, within Central America from Costa Rica to Nicaragua, that's gonna happen as well. The Venezuelans, of course, that are in many parts of uh, the region may also be uh, hurt and not be, I don't know how much they can send back to their countries, but uh, they're gonna be hit as well. So these multiple shocks are really a sort of a, a thunderstorm, if you want, for, for Latin America. And uh, the current estimate is that as a whole, the region is expected to contract. This is from the JEP, the Global Economic Prospects that were just released by the World Bank, that the region may fall on average by 7.2%. And uh, this, you know, uh, just this month after the IMF released its, its World Economic Outlook, where it projected that the region was going to fall by 5.2, so it's already two percentage points higher. And uh, what we tend to hear is that this may be really underestimating what we can expect to happen in the region. And of course, the countries that are going to be very severely hit is Brazil, 
Uh, in the JEP is uh, one of the worst performers after Venezuela with contraction of about uh, 8%. And then Mexico and Argentina are also estimated to contract by around 7%. This is a JEP. However, for example, local estimates for Mexico have uh, projected that actually the contraction could be uh, of the order of 10%. So we're talking about huge numbers. And uh, we're talking about a very, if you want, lukewarm recovery in 2021 of the order of less than 3% for the region as a whole. So that adverse shock, of course, is going to create uh, tremendous distress on many parts of the economy. And uh, let me uh, sort of discuss a little bit what we expect in terms of which sectors are the ones that are going to get hurt the most. I think that... Um, I'm going to show you a couple of slides here because here is I'm going to show also a research in progress that we're doing in which we're estimating possible scenarios, particularly the confinement policies. Now, uh, what would happen if you know those uh, sectors that are at risk, 50% uh, of the population actually lose their income and they lose around 50% of their income? I'm going to show you a couple of slides on Argentina and and Colombia. And we're going to do this also for Brazil. Hopefully, we're working on that, and, and Mexico. So the paper hopefully will have a comparison of these four countries, which should be quite interesting. So we know that poverty is going to increase whenever you have a contraction of this order of magnitude. It's huge. CEPAL produced uh, some estimates, but they were based on the previous projections. So now they're probably obsolete, and that's one of the problems we have with things happening so quickly and so drastically. But CEPAL had uh, estimated that moderate poverty would increase by about 30 million and uh, extreme poverty by 16. But that probably now is a lower bound of what's going to happen in, in the region. Um, so let me share the screen now. You see it? Uh, I can't hear, I mean... Not yet, not yet, Nora. No? No, not yet. I can see it, but uh, so what shall I do? So if you hit share screen and then it says full screen and you press OK. All right, let me do that again then. Okay. Because I thought I had done that. So share screen, share. There we go, here. perfect. There we go, perfect. Excellent. So let me put ourselves away <laughs> and let me put, I mean, it's just going to be just a couple of slides, but uh, let me put it in, in presentation mode. Yes. If I can. There we go. Okay, so here I'm comparing Argentina urban with Colombia urban because for Argentina, the data that we have from the household service is only urban. And just to show you something interesting uh, is that, you know, what we have here are different income sources. It looks like a, a nice abstract painting, but uh, they're income sources. The orange are cash transfers. And I've ordered the families from the poorest, these are individuals actually, income per capita, the lowest to the left, the highest to the right in both uh, graphs. And here's the percentage of income from different sources orange being cash transfers, usually targeted to the poor. The yellow, with, which uh, we have in Colombia, is uh, self-consumption. Uh, in Colombia, we have a little bit of self-consumption in, in urban areas and, and a lot in rural areas. The uh, gray is contributory pensions, a pension system from the, uh, pensions from the social security system, which in Argentina started at quite a low income. The blue is, uh, the light blue is um, income from government employment. The green is income from the, oops, it moved to, income from uh, essential uh, industries, meaning that it's not in principle at risk. So all of this is an extreme assumption and we're relaxing it and see what happens. And blue, is the income at risk, the essential, the non-essential industries, both in, in Argentina, urban, and in Colombia. 
And the thing to point out here is that, as you can see, the incomes at risk happen throughout the income distribution, right? So there's going to be two different groups that not necessarily are exactly the same. We're going to have losers who are not poor, and we're going to have losers who are poor. And the governments have to decide how to address the compensation for the losers who are, are not poor and also for the, the ones that are poor. And uh, to do that is quite a challenge because there is uh, the problem of informality in which uh, some of the people who are in the bottom end but also in the in-between are in the formal sector. For the very poor, you have a lot of them, maybe the regis registries that come from the, the um, targeted transfers. But for those in the middle, those are the ones that are hard to track because they're not necessarily in any registry and uh, they're in the, because they're in the formal sector and they may, the group of people who become poor as a result of the crisis. So the challenge here is for the governments, I think I would say there are two, two main, main ones here. Uh, one is how to uh, contain the macro shock, which I, I discussed uh, earlier because one of the key policy instruments if you want to deal with a, a fallout of a pandemic or any economic crisis is to minimize the negative effect on average economic activity and protect overall employment and then at the same time protect the losers, the losers who are not poor, and the losers and the poor. Uh, the poor who are losers are in a particularly more difficult situation because even though they have cash transfers as a cushion, they get hit uh, in multiple dimensions from which if they are not helped now, it's gonna be for them very difficult to uh, overcome. The emphasis here is that for the poor, compared to other sectors of the population, in addition to the income shocks that are caused by, by these uh, overall uh, shocks to the economy, you have shocks to their human capital. And one in particular, well, I mean, uh, Arachu was discussing uh, initially the, the, in the impact on, on maternal mortality and infant mortality underlying that is also uh, probably an increase in undernutrition which has an impact, as we know, which is long lasting on people's ability to generate higher livelihoods in the future. So you're affecting their conditions, not only today, but also for the rest of their lives, if that happens today. The same thing goes with education. We know from previous crises that uh, people tend to drop out or uh, they do not, um, continue after they finish one of the cycles to the next cycle, or they postpone enrolling in primary school. That's been very typical in previous, in previous of the large crisis. So we're probably gonna see something similar here, added to the fact that now we have uh, many countries, the schools are closed and the children are supposed to be able to continue their education through other means. Well, the poor have very scarce means to continue their education at home without uh, a doubt. And so you're also affecting the human capital on the education side, which is also a factor that will play into producing bad outcomes in the future. So what, uh, what are, one of the things that I, I wanna communicate here is that it's very important to actually focus on protecting the poor, not just the losers who are not poor, but they may some of them become poor because they may be able to come back. But the poor who are at the bottom may never be able to come back because the impact on their human capital could be of the kind that is irreversible and you're sort of sowing the seeds for uh, the uh, reduction in income in the future and more inequality in the future. So what is to be done Sorry, this, I keep showing this. I I'm gonna stop sharing now because um, I'm gonna go back to, so what's to be done? So first of all, I think that uh, you need to mitigate the impact on the economy overall. And for that, obviously countries have been trying to do their 
most fiscal policy, practically all the countries have implemented pretty large packages with the exception of Mexico, which if we want, we can discuss Mexico separately, but most of the countries have implemented pretty large packages. And probably countries will have to make use more and more of, uh, if you're on an orthodox or unconventional policies on the uh, uh, monetary side, which includes uh, the roles of central banks and also the roles of uh, development banks. And this is probably something that we'll see more and more as a fiscal maneuvering becomes uh, less and less available to countries. Interestingly, compared to many other crises, since uh, we, we wrote a piece with a co-author, Jorge Mariscal, that uh, we say this is a crisis without culprits. And so there's no, if you want, concern about you know moral hazard in a sense. I mean, people were not responsible for the pandemic. They may have had better or worse responses in terms of containment, but people are not responsible for the pandemic. Then uh, the, and people understand that also a lot of the crisis is self-induced through the com containment policies. So there's a great support across the board of economists from the most orthodox to the least of implementing pretty, uh, if you want, uh, counter-cyclical policies that are quite aggressive. That's a good thing because then that's also supported by the, by the multilateral organizations, which probably in order to help the, the region will need to be much more padded than what they are now. Uh, particularly the development and the regional development banks need, may need some um, more capital in order to <clears throat> help the region not only deal with the current and short term, but also the medium term. Now, from the point of view of, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, the group of people who are losing and not necessarily poor, some of them may become poor, some may just uh, experience uh, income falls, then you, know, you probably want to try to implement some sort of uh, uh, cash transfers and countries have been trying to do that. But as I said, one of the um, hurdles is how to reach, particularly those who are in the informal sector, not all of them are poor, some of them are in the middle. That's been a, a big challenge. Uh, and uh, there's uh, difficulty in doing that. And therefore, um, there's parts of these groups that are not being uh, helped at all, I think. They fall between the cracks as a result. Uh, you probably also want to start exploring employment programs. Some people are thinking, well, how can you have employment programs when you have containment policies? But there are sectors that you need to expand even during uh, containment policies that are related to the pandemic itself. And you might be able to create uh, sort of win-win situations in which uh, emergency employment programs can generate income for those who are laid off from non sectors and at the same time help uh, if you want pad so, uh, or produce a labor supply in sectors where you're short. You know? uh, so, you know, those are the, the ones, the policies that are dealing with, with the middle, if you want, which is mainly cash. At the bottom, and this, you know, there's a paper that we wrote, Mariano Tomasi, and it's been published by the UNDP, uh, and I think, uh, I, I don't know if I sent it to you or if you've seen it, but I, I can make it available. I mean, it's available in the website, both in Spanish and English. Uh, that what we're suggesting is that you really need to target policies to the poor that respond to the needs of the poor and vulnerable, depending on where they live. And that for that, you probably need to have an approach which is uh, coordinated at the sort of in, an, in, an interagency that deals with different aspects of what uh, the poor may be facing because if you rely on line ministries you're likely to miss important things that need to be dealt with and that the approach has to be multifaceted because as we know it's not only income that they're losing what we're um, learning is that there is a rise in domestic violence which has become quite a problem for women but also children and the elderly and it's much harder to deal with that, of course, when you have containment policies in the midst of the pandemic. And uh, one uh, probably of the main aspects that needs to be addressed is education. And education, now you have the problem that you're going to do it um, through remote means for a while, then how do you do that in, in, in areas where there is no uh, internet or Wi-Fi? You have to find ways in which you can make accessible to people having um, the uh, the reach to 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 be able to 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 take uh, lessons remotely, but 
we know that without the coach, without the mentor, that's not going to work either. So you probably need to have programs that are pretty well packaged and with, remotely also you will need to have a mentoring system that can help children uh, continue their education. I think this is very, very hard to do, but uh, it has to be tried. Because otherwise, you know, these, like I said earlier, are costs that could be reversible. You can have a large increase in dropout rates uh, as a result of this. And again, as I said earlier, these are the seeds of more poverty and more inequality in the future. One of the main causes of the waves in increasing and declining inequality is what happens to the distribution of education because that affects relative wages in the labor market. So when inequality declined in Latin America, it was because we had a push education in the 90s which resulted, among other things, that was a key factor in a decline in inequality in the 2000s. However, in contrast, in the crisis in the 1980s, you had an increase in the uh, uh, inequality and distribution of education and a reduction in the accumulation of uh, years of schooling, and that was the kernel of the rising inequality in the 1990s. So if we don't deal with a problem that affects human capital and particular education now, we'll probably see more inequality in the future in a region which uh, had experienced uh, progress, but as we know, that progress had started to reverse and it's still the most unequal in the world. So let me stop here so we can hear uh, Joe and then we can also hear questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nora. So Joe, now we've talked about the, the, the health and the economic and educational hurdles and, and challenges. Now we're gonna turn to you to talk about uh, the political dimensions of the pandemic in, in the region. Thank you, Lorena. It's a pleasure and, and a great challenge to follow such uh, savvy or savvias and, and experts in these areas. And uh, of course, it must be understood that everything that uh, professors Castro and Rustig have told us impinges upon and helps us to understand the political system, that these areas are inextricably tied together. Costa Rica and Cuba have the strongest public health systems because of political decisions by leaders of those countries and it has been a state policy for generations, and we're seeing that. My understanding of the political impact of uh, COVID-19, the pandemic in Latin America, uh, is to look at it as creating enormous stress at points of weakness that already existed. In other words, the pandemic didn't create new phenomena in Latin America. And when I talk about Latin America, it's understood we're dealing with an enormously heterogeneous set of countries from the tiny to the huge, uh, the, the ethnically diverse and the relatively homogeneous and so on. So the heterogeneous must be kept in mind uh, in all generalizations. But my starting point is that the pandemic didn't create problems. What it has done and will continue to do, as both Rauchu and Nora have made very plain, is to press huge stress on existing points of weakness. And I want to mention five. First, the lack of strong leadership and weak institute, national institutions. These have made these together have made any response, policies and otherwise, difficult. Strong leadership is a necessary but not sufficient condition for containing the pandemic, but it's excruciatingly difficult when there's no leadership. The second stress point is that political representation, the people of the country to feel trust in the state and to feel the notion that they can participate in some way has been under great stress for at least a generation. Political parties in Latin America are more fragmented today than they have been at any time in the last 20 or 30 years. 
and this is across the region. So to the extent that we can expect or hope that political parties will aggregate public opinion or will make people feel that they're part of the process, they are less able to do so today than they have been in many, many years. The third stress point, and Nora has referred to this on more than one point of her presentation, the polities of Latin America, without exception, have failed to include major portions of their populations. And that will vary from country to country. In the Andean countries, it refers to racial groups, not minorities, sometimes majorities. In Brazil, it's a function of blackness. The blacker you are, the less access you have to social services, to the state, to education, and so on, which overlaps with the data that Arachu pointed out and the data that Nora presented. So exclusion is a weak point in Latin America, and it has been exacerbated the lack of access Nora pointed to. If you're going to do online education, what happens if you don't have a computer? Many poor households do not have a computer and they don't have access to Wi-Fi. Online education looks good in an academic paper on how you spread education widely in a society, but the reality may make it difficult if not impossible. And then the point that Nora raised, I simply want to mention it as a stress point in Latin America is inequality. Even developed countries such as the United States have suffered immediate dramatic increases in inequality. And Latin America, which as Nora stated, is the most unequal region in the world, will become more unequal. And what will the state and leadership do to reverse that, she mentioned the 1990s. The reverse of the inequality, Brazil, for example, improved its Gini coefficient, the easiest single number to record inequality, in the 1990s through a set of well-conceived, broadly applied policies which stretched across two different presidential administrations, Fernando Henrique Cardoso and Lula. And when those policies were first diluted and then ended, the genie has gone back, in, not into the bottle, but back to where it was in Brazil 25 years ago. So the stress point of inequality in Latin America will be exacerbated. And then there's one final point. And again, Nora referred to this, a stress point for all of Latin America. Unlike some of the more developed countries in the world, all of the countries in, the Latin, in Latin America, even the most developed among them, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, are vulnerable to external shocks. The price of corn, the so-called commodities. They have no control over the price of those commodities upon which their economic welfare and their political space depend. China seems to be recovering its economy faster than most. If that is the case, Paraguay will, have, will be able to export more soy. Argentina will sell some more beef and grain and soy. Brazil has already celebrated a new trade pact with China. It remains to be seen how either of those two can put the pact in force. The point is, these are external vulnerabilities and the pandemic has exacerbated them. To the extent that we rely on something like online education, where does that technology come from? It has to be imported. Where does the capital come from to fill up that colored graph that Nora showed? There is no country in Latin America, underline the no, that has sufficient domestic capital to buy its way or pay its way out of this economic shock. 
So even when you have strong leadership, there are still so many other stress points which have been made weaker by the pandemic that the economic recovery will be complicated by these weaknesses. How will we deal with extreme poverty? What portion of our human capital across the region will be, as Nora suggested, irreversibly lost? That will be a generation or two to make up. Finally, as part of the external vulnerabilities, a comment that to my, I, I don't know if surprise is the correct word, let's just say, I'll be more editorial, to my dismay, multilateralism in the region is at its lowest point in 25 years. Now, again, the lack of multilateral initiatives existed before the pandemic. It began two or three years ago in a gradual decline. In countries with weak resource base, in countries with external vulnerabilities, in countries without independent capacity to pay their own way, there's been no effort to say, well, maybe we can do this better on a regional basis. Maybe we can share health resources. If in fact, Chile has fewer cases than Peru, perhaps the Pacific Alliance, which is one of the very few multilateral um, alliances still operating in the region, maybe the Pacific Alliance can help. Uruguay and Paraguay have extremely low rates of infection. Uruguay might be able to help out. The collapse of the health systems to which Arauchu referred is one of the most devastating effects. And the recovery will require the kind of economic resources that Nora explained will be difficult to find. And even where the resources are available, and our point is extremely important, that the multilaterals are in a generous mode and the cost of capital today is probably as low as it's been at least for 20 or 30 years. So if you're going to go into debt the way the developed countries have, including the United States, it's a cheap, a good time to do it. So the capital's available. With weak political leadership, and fractured political participation using those resources becomes more difficult. And to the extent that each country insists on going it alone for whatever reason, and the reasons vary from country to country, it will be that much more difficult. So the recovery from the pandemic has to be political, as well as economic. And that will be a good portion of the challenge in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, so usually in these, in these seminars, what we do is we invite uh, the audience to ask questions and falamos um, portugués, hablamos español, we speak English. So um, even though the, the opening remarks and the seminar, we started speaking in English for the questions, uh, we're, you're welcome to ask in any of those three languages and I can try to translate uh, if, how you wanna ask. Um, I wanted to just start by posing one of the, the panel, one, of, one question to all three of you is, um, <laughs> one of the things we wanted to do and organize the panel this way is that usually we find that a lot of these sessions we focus just on documenting the health dimensions and we focus just on talking about the economic dimensions or just on the political implications, but we don't bridge those perspectives and think about uh, the trade-offs. And at least in Brazil, one of the things that uh, is happening a lot is exactly this, this struggle of who wins the, the negotiation. Is it politics trumping economics or trumping health? Um, is the economy more important than the health considerations? 
Um, so I, 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 unfair thing, but to start, if I can ask, how do you guys see some of these? And I think Joe, you, you talked a little bit about this, but it would be interesting to, to hear you guys reflect a little bit on that. Do you have any order? I mean, you can feel free how. Yeah, I think that, uh, well, let me say first that uh, something that I've tweeted a lot uh, is that science denying leaders in a country are a danger for humanity as a whole. That was one of them. So, you know, unfortunately, you have one. And I think that that's uh, pretty terrible. We have one too. Uh, to some extent, Mexico has had one, although it's been moving in, in the right direction lately, I hope. Uh, so that, that's a problem because it not only affects the own country, but if you don't exterminate the virus throughout the world, then there's what economists call negative externalities. And so we all get uh, you know, tanked by, by having what happens in one country more than with other things. You know, I mean, with the environment, we also have these negative externalities, but in this case, they're extreme. Um, I think that uh, the, the fact that, I mean, it's, it's too bad that in many countries, instead of statesmanship, we had political and cheap, cheap political maneuvering. But some countries have shown that they have statesmen and they've risen much more to the occasion and they're really trying to sort of implement policies that uh, try to balance the challenges that they face. I, I think Joe may, may, may know more of the details about that, but I, I, I can see that there is diversity and some are doing better than others in, in terms of uh, being uh, the right to the occasion. That's, uh, that's something you know, one cannot change by design <laughs> because you, the leaders are there, so movements can push back and who knows what's gonna happen now. You know, we're living different degrees of chaos in different countries as a result of these uh, tensions. A more difficult question is, which is linked to politics, but it also, it also has a dimension that's non-political, is what is the balance between protecting lives and protecting livelihoods. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I know that people are trying to say that trade-off doesn't exist. And it may not exist in the medium term. Uh, I mean, there's research from the previous pandemic that shows that uh, con uh, the counties in the U.S. that were protecting lives uh, did much better in the recovery. But that was a different pandemic because it hurt the labor supply, which is not the case of this one. The fact that this one is focused uh, primarily on hurting uh, the group who's outside of the labor supply, like most of the elderly and the most vulnerable, but primarily the elderly are the ones who are uh, disproportionately hurt, makes it, uh, if you want, uh, in, in, in a way a little more horrible from this dilemma's point of view, because if you had lots of people hurt uh, that are in the primary age, working age, then there wasn't going to be a trade-off. Right now, there is a trade-off. So I think that uh, we don't have a perfect solution to that, but uh, we know that in many countries, the extreme containment policies are uh, hurting the poor a lot. You know that. We need to face that. And th that's causing death probably as a result of malnutrition and other things that, you know, all the things that you may be adding uh, in terms of uh, stress to, to people who are living below the poverty line does have to be weighed against the loss of life through, through the uh, containment policies. So I think that the, the probably, you know, the ideal solution will be if you can find what some people call smart or targeted containment uh, policies in which you can actually isolate much more the uh, outbreaks of, of, uh, of the, the, the dissemination of the, the spreading of the virus at the same time that you can allow parts of the economy to, to function. Uh, unfortunately, the fact that uh, so many countries started late in responding, because if you do this very early, then it's much easier because you, you can actually uh, put all your efforts in containing in spots. 
makes this a more challenging option. But I don't see, I think, you know, we're going to, we're going to see these back and forth in terms of uh, opening, then maybe there's going to be a recurrence of uh, outbreaks and you may have to sort of clamp down the opening in some parts of the, of the countries. But I don't see that you are able, you will be able to sustain strict confinement policies where you have them for longer, for a much longer period of time. It's, it's not possible because people are really hurting and you're hurting those who also, you don't want to hurt because you can't really compensate them in full. So that's, you know, currently my view, it is very unfortunate, but I do think that there is a trade-off right now and uh, we are all having to deal with that. I don't know what, what uh, I mean, I'm curious to listen to Aracho as a health expert, if she, she agrees. Hopefully she says that she doesn't agree because it would make me very happy if there is no trade-off. <laughs> and, uh, and Joe, what do you think about you know, the politics of this? Aracho. Aracho, adelante. Well, um, I've been trying to pay attention to the political response, which is extremely important um, for healthcare. And um, I have, um, it's hard to understand from my perspective, what are the patterns in the response to the pandemic, the political patterns? Because I don't see, I don't see real patterns according to political ideology. And um, as Nora mentioned, um, you know we have the chaos that has been uh, characterized in the United States. And uh, in Brazil, at least from what I see from here, and um, there are countries that have also pretended that there's no pandemic, and that is the case in Nicaragua, for example, and um, which is a country that had, uh, despite not having too many resources, had built a primary care system that reached out, reached a large extent of the population. And I'm not talking about ancient times. I've been to Nicaragua many times to work with the Ministry of Public Health and, uh, and uh, it's very impressive what they had accomplished in terms of reaching out to populations in, in rural areas. And uh, now what I hear is that and many, I mean, it's in, the, in newspapers, but I'm also in touch with colleagues in Nicaragua who are extremely concerned, and not only um, colleagues that I know, but also former ministers of health who used to belong to the same political party of the current, um, of Ortega. And um, they've, they are very frustrated because there's not being any response that makes any coherence. There's been mostly a denial of the impact of the pandemic. And, uh, but you, you know, for example, there were, um, I've been very closely in touch with my colleagues in Cuba and in Costa Rica, for example, where the Minister of Health in Costa Rica, for example, has become uh, the superhero. And uh, for the country, they've, they've even done little um, emojis with him as a superhero and, um, it's it's really from what i understand he's taken over the entire country in the the response for the entire country take uh providing actually a lot of leverage for the president and um in cuba there's been a, a response that it's the one that i expected given that they have a very well organized primary care primary health care system and a high expertise in the control of infectious disease and that has a lot. I, I was actually in Cuba when they diagnosed the first case, and uh, immediately um, I uh, immediately uh, Cuba was still allowed to remain <laughs> for a few more days, but uh, immediately they um, they asked all foreign people to leave, and uh, to they were 
well, there were some who got, were, got stuck, but they actually, they did limit um, who could uh, circulation to the country and, and, um, and they were able to, they've been able to actually contain the pandemic relatively quickly with uh, some, uh, a few cases, a, a few deaths, but uh, not to the extent of other countries. In the Dominican Republic, where I also work uh, and go there often, my colleagues there told me that 40% of the hospitals were dedicated to COVID patients. And uh, the population didn't know where to go for care. And for example, I work on maternal and child health and uh, pregnancy and childbirth occurs all the time. It's not, um, it, it's a very, uh, it, it just happens every day. And a lot of um, pregnant people, they don't know where to go. I've been, I've monitored closely the statistics that are published and uh, thus far, the most recent data don't indicate any uh, increase in maternal deaths, but I'm not, I, I wanna take that with a grain of salt because in the Dominican Republic, they quickly report the maternal deaths that occur in hospitals, which is the majority but they, it takes them much longer to report those that occur outside the health system. So what I'm, um, I'm assuming is that there are a greater number of maternal deaths and neonatal deaths occurring outside of the health system. And that is why the statistics, statistics still do not report those deaths. And uh, we, we're gonna have to figure other ways of estimating the impact on maternal child health. But uh, on the other hand, in the Dominican Republic, they quickly provided Mm, cash transfers to people through their identity cards. And uh, that worked pretty quickly. So there's been the, vari the variety of the responses is, is great and um, throughout, the, throughout the region. And of course, in countries such as, that are very large, such as Brazil, every state responds differently and uh, there are all these confrontations between the federal level and the state level and the municipality level and that happens in other countries too where there are municipalities who do not want to abide by whatever their province or state uh, re recommendations are so but the, for me as a public health um, expert my concern is what happens to the people no matter uh, what the political tendencies of the countries where they live. And what happens to people is uh, reflected in, a, in an increase in morbidity and mortality and in the reverse of achievements that had taken years and efforts to, to uh, achieve. And, um, and that it's very worrisome. So in addition to the increased number of people going without jobs, and uh, without having enough food to eat. And uh, there's also been an increase of uh, violence inside the households and lack of reporting of the violence. Mm, I didn't mention adolescent health because I still don't have the data, but uh, I'm expecting that there's going to be an increase in both the number of adolescents who become pregnant and uh, as a result of violence uh, because most adolescents who get pregnant, as a, uh, as a reminder, it's a result of rape. And uh, even if it was supposedly consensual uh, by law, a uh, minor who gets pregnant is usually a result of having been raped. And um, there are that um, there's also going to be a, probably a, an increase in unsafe abortions. Latin America has the... Uh, is the most the strictest region in the world in terms of abortion policies and that causes a lot of deaths due to unsafe abortions and um, there's a great inequity in access to a safe abortion and with the pandemic there's probably going to be an increase in the number of unsafe abortions and uh, that may result in increased number of maternal deaths as well. So I'm mostly, you know, I'm trying to look at the region, what are different things that are happening, but I'm deeply concerned about the consequences. Yeah. I, uh, I think one of the things to um, 
keep in mind is that the uh, what Nora refers to correctly, uh, the so-called trade-off between life and uh, being able to earn a living, uh, which is a subject of debate in all of the countries, developed or undeveloped. <clears throat> what makes the successful cases stand out? Um, a non-Latin American country, New Zealand, just declared itself free, has no new cases of COVID for the last week. Uh, now that's a very small country, uh, but the elements of its success have to be recognized. And one of them, which I hadn't talked about earlier, we used to call in the classroom political culture. And when the head of state, prime minister of New Zealand, calls for self-quarantine and social distancing, the response to that, short of political imposition, the response to that is, is a result of what the people at large consider that to be a reasonable request on behalf of their leader. So the trust in the state is a crucial variable. And what's uh, been the case in Latin America, if we t take that single variable and look quickly around the region, where it's been most successful is in Uruguay. And again, it's the Uruguayos who have been able en masse to say, well, okay, this is not an unreasonable request of us. And then the politics of how public health is distributed is a crucial uh, dimension to the capacity of any country in the region to deal with the pandemic. They had at the moment the crisis began a surprisingly capable, coherent leader, but he had no backup. And further, he had one other critical weakness, what I referred to earlier as stress points. Peru has one of the highest levels of what we call informality in the entire region. These are people <coughs> whose earnings are off the books, who don't pay taxes, who don't participate in the state, may or may not be impoverished. Some are, some are not. There tends also to be a high correlation between informality and their Indian indigenous and ethnicity. And when the president of Peru, Martin Vizcarra, called for self-quarantine and social distancing, 200,000 people left the federal capital. They wanted no part of it. And they went back to their family homes someplace in the Sierra. And so it was very difficult. There was no political response on the part of the people of Peru in support of the requests made. And then, a yet a third category of confusion in one of the most, one of the strongest public health systems in the region, Chile, one of the most educated, part, highly participant publics fell apart. It wasn't that the leader was incoherent. He had lots of things to say, each of them coherent but he couldn't hold, can't hold his own political coalition together. And to my surprise, the political opposition, which is actually about 55, 60% of public opinion and the policy, hasn't been able to agree on a single measure to deal with the pandemic in the last four months. So Piñera, the president, goes on television and says, we're gonna have a call for common good. We're gonna have a meeting, we're gonna televise, we're gonna have a meeting of all the heads of all the political parties. And they get together with the appropriate ministers and undersecretaries and what have you, and they can't agree on anything. So that's a surprise. And the number of cases in Chile, uh, whatever denominator Araucho suggests that we use, are as bad as some of the worst cases in Latin America. Brazil, which is a case, as we all know, like todo el mundo. Um, the saving grace, literally in terms of public health, the saving grace is the country's federalism. The president makes a joke of the pandemic, refuses to participate, gets, goes through health ministers like 
um, you know, an asadu in the afternoon. But the states have held to their independent action. And so the only um, social response, the political culture in Brazil over the last 90 days has occurred at the state level. Otherwise, there would have been, there would be absolute chaos. And the final point, which leans on Nora's data, is that access to health is crucial. Argentina has one of the strongest health systems in the region, but not in the Vigas Miserias. And the highest incidence of contagion is in the Vigas. There was no health care, literally. Only now has the so-called populist Peronist government begun literally to bring health care into the visa because they realize, the leaders realize that if they don't do something about this hot spot, given the nature of the workforce in the greater metropolitan area of Buenos Aires, infected people from the visa will hop on a bus, hop on a colectivo and go to work and bring the contagion into the center of the city. So there's now been an effort, short term, we'll see if any of it lasts, of bringing health care into the areas of the greater metropolitan area, which were literally unserved. And again, this is a problem that affects developed countries. Afro-Americans are dying from COVID at twice the rate of their population. And again, it's access to health care, which is a problem in the United States, and especially for minority groups and for poor people. So if we take those same variables and sort of jump around quickly in an intellectual exercise from country to country to country, see what's happened, see what the public response to the leadership's call for quarantine and containment have produced, who's paying attention, do they trust the government to lead them? How wide spread in terms of demography, how widespread is healthcare? Cuba, it's not an accident that Cuba has the best World Health Organization statistics, better than the United States in several of the key indicators. Arachu made that point. Um, the Costa Rican case is a wonderful example of political culture, and of course, a health minister who loves being on television. So that's been, uh, and everyone gets to sit down in, in San Jose and watch the health minister give the, um, here we get to listen to our governor of New York, the new vi video star, governor of New York, Mr. Cuomo, gets on TV every day. Everyone wants to tune in and see how they're doing. In Costa Rica, the health minister was a star. And uh, the president was delighted to give him the time because before the pandemic hit, he was about to be censored in the Senate for malfeasance. So he's um, happy to take a vacation from some of that stress. But it varies radically from country to country. What AMLO is doing in Mexico is beyond my understanding. On the one hand, one day he sounds like Bolsonaro, that the, it's just a little bad cold or it's all fake data. And then his own health minister has to say that uh, we're working on getting the data together. It's a very sophisticated country. They have the data. They won't share it with you and me. And that's, a, that's an indicator. Ortega doesn't, denies there's any, uh, been any mortality at all. And he's ordered several of the uh, Managua hospitals to put the cause of death as unusual pneumonia. Pneumonia abnormal is located, written on the death certificate. So why do certain leaders hide information? We ask that in my country as well. But I mean, that's a question to ask as you go around watching or observing or understanding how different countries in Latin America are handling things. Maduro in, um, in Caracas and Venezuela is behaving the same way. Do you really know how many people are sick? Hospitals were stressed without medicines long before COVID arrived. What are we gonna do with the 400,000 Venezolanos who are trying to go back to Venezuela? 
from Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Anyway, um, my point is that uh, the capacity to win the support of your public is crucial, a crucial feature of leadership. And it varies radically from around the, around the region as you take a quick sort of survey. Thanks, Lorena. Thank you. So I think one of the things that, um, a question that's posed um, for, for you guys, uh, and I think it, it talks and it speaks a little bit also to some things that Joe and, and Nora touched on briefly, um, talking about the issue of multilateralism. Um, but I think the, the broader issue that this speaks to, especially if we think within countries, is that there's also uh, multi, there's a, a, a need to have, the more so solidarity we have within countries, within societies, the more we cooperate and we work together. <laughs> um, and so kind of thinking about that issue about multilateralism, how, how much or why hasn't there been uh, a multilateral response in Latin America, um, at least to countries that think similar, their leaders think similarly together. Why hasn't there been more cooperation to work together as, as Joe suggested? Um, the question is from Rafael Lloris. Uh, he, he had asked that this, he's really interested in this multilateral element and uh, he wants to know a little bit more about that. Why is it so hard um, for us to work more together? More closely. He has to read my book, which is available in Portuguese and Spanish. That okay. the end is there. It's a very pessimistic conclusion, which I wrote, which when I wrote it two years ago. My point earlier was that the um, failure to uh, collaborate across countries began before the pandemic. It's only been exacerbated by the pandemic. And the groupings, which looked as if they might cohere at some point, for example, uh, Fernandez and Peronis in Argentina with um, Bolivia and so on. Uh, of course, the uh, Bolivia had a change in government, a coup, if you like. And uh, there was cooperation, as I pointed out, in the so-called Pacific Alliance, which is actually continues to work. But uh, in, in this case, the failing partner in the sense of showing leadership is Chile, which is, seems to be uh, falling apart as we watch on a daily basis, which is actually, I, I exaggerate, the uh, public health system in Chile is doing reasonably well. But uh, politically, there's no great leadership there. So any collective action has nothing. So there are uh, progressive governments uh, now there's, uh, that might work together, except uh, Venezuela is not capable of collaborating with anybody. Um, Fer Ortega similarly is not ready to collaborate with anybody. And um, I'm not sure that Cuba and Argentina have that much in common. On the conservative or right side, right wing side, but it doesn't, there are more of them now with Uruguay, Paraguay, Chile, uh, Vizcarra sort of center right, um, and certainly Colombia, there just doesn't seem to be any interest at all in even exploring how collective action, whether it's for COVID or whether it's for hydroelectric power or whether it's for standing up for their regional interests against a hegemonic power, however that's understood. Um, um, there's really no easy answer uh, for that, I'm sorry to say, at least in my opinion. Nora, Arachu? Well, there's been um, some, um, I don't know how so, so sexual they will be, but I'm, hopefully, I hope, I'm hopeful. So on the one hand, um, this is something I sent the link earlier, uh, a short comment that I wrote that talks about how Fiocruz in Rio de Janeiro has been designated as the reference laboratory for COVID-19 in the Americas. And uh, the idea is to work cooperatively with other countries in the region to develop uh, diagnostics, uh, treatments, and vaccines for COVID. There was also um, the Solidarity Call to Action promoted by the government of Costa Rica in partnership with the World Health Organization, to which several countries have subscribed throughout the world. And uh, 
um, includes Argentina, Barbados, Belize, Brazil, Chile, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Uruguay. So several countries have signed up to that call for action, which includes for the voluntarily pool of, of intellectual property for any technology that can respond to the vaccine. And finally, um, there's been a, a, a group of public health leaders from Latin America have created the global movement. It's called the Global Movement for Sustainable Health Equity. And uh, that has received signatures from around the world also that has proposed to the UN Secretary General to create a global health equity task force based at the World Health Organization to create a right, rights-based roadmap, roadmap for the abolition of patents related also to the pandemic. Um, of course, those are good intentions uh, and uh, I, I'm actually uh, one of the signatories, but I'm, um, I'm hoping that the objective will be met. But what I, I wanted to mention is that I'm very hopeful that while the vaccines get developed, that at least there's time to get organized to make sure that once vaccines are available, they're really available for everyone. And that there's no instance of discrimination that could perpetuate the current tragedy that many people are experiencing on a daily basis. Let's hope so. But this would be an initiative of what I would call international civil society. There's another fabulous one coming out of Oxford where they have signed on with a couple of other private, com uh, with some private companies to make available without profit anything they come up with in their search for a vaccine. Uh, these are not state leaders standing up. I mean, you are a signator to that. And the selection of the group in um, Rio again, is a local or state. There's similar one, uh, Favesp has, has sponsored one at, at, in Sao Paulo, in a hospital in Sao Paulo that's working on a vaccine. But uh, I would say that that's international civil society and it's occurring almost in spite of the head of the Brazilian state in the cases of Rio and Sao Paulo. Um, Costa Rica may be the exception that proves my point. That is to say, it's a state that is that has actually its soft power for ever since Oscar Arias has been based on reaching out and solving international programs and uh, problems and recognizing that by itself it can't solve much, um, and that's an excellent use of its soft power. Uh, Chile used to do that too, but hasn't for a while. So uh, let's hope these things work. But uh, we're not talking about heads of state sitting down in some virtual general assembly saying we'll all work together to, to solve these problems. No, uh, it's, a, it's very tough. And thinking about the vaccine in Nora's presentation, also you can think of that governments are going to have to choose who to prioritize and that maybe they're going to think about, ah, do we prioritize essential workers? Who, the, where, who's we're going to have to set priorities for the economy or are the priorities going to be risk and vulner vulnerability to, to death. Um, there's some very difficult choices with vaccines that we face in Latin America. Um, Nora, there's a question that I think is more about, is for you about, but I guess everyone can participate in, in answers from Juman Maziero asking, what are the chances of spreading the universal basic income in the region as Spain is implementing and taxing, taxing fortunes wealth instead of labor to deal with the next new uh, abnormal or a normal. So mm -hmm. is this, yeah. Is this I mean, the, uh, well, I'm so, sorry, you were, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, go ahead. So there's two questions in a way, no? I mean, one is um, the discussion of whether we should have a universal basic in income implemented. I mean, right now we've seen that the fact that you do not have a broader safety net is causing serious problems because there's all these people who are becoming poor and you can't reach because they were not in the registries uh, and they're in the formal sector and therefore they're uh, very hard to, to find, so to speak. 
that speaks in favor of having a broader safety net more towards a universal one. But uh, this is a discussion I have with uh, many colleagues. We're, we're having an ongoing discussion also with Oxfam. I think one has to be aware of the trade-offs. There's no way around it that the more you spread money around to people who don't need it, the less you're using it for the poor. So there's a trade-off in terms of how much you help the poor vis-a-vis -vis having a universal basic income. And that trade-off has to be part of the, if you want, conversation, because uh, given that we have still large uh, pockets of extreme poverty in some countries, we may want to first deal with that group. Nevertheless, uh, the, the other question is, well, what about if you try to fund a universal basic income that ensures that there is a basic income for the poor and at the same time a safety net for those who are not poor if they're uh, faced with an adverse shock. There the trade-off is that you probably would have to, uh, in some cases, raise taxes on the middle classes to an extent that there would be, uh, if you want, resistance. Who would be the net payers of the UBI? Because if you want a, a budget neutral, Perhaps it's not enough to tax the very rich to cover everybody with a UBI that's sufficiently generous that provides a floor for the for the poor that you know raises people's income uh, to uh, as close to the poverty line as you can. So there's another trade-off to consider. So I think that the way to pose it is probably that there should be a universal right to a basic income universal right to a basic income, not necessarily a universal basic income, a universal right to a basic income that you should have everybody registered. And when people fall into poverty, when they were not poor before, then you just automatically trigger the system and are able to reach them in a way that you were not able to reach them now. Having said that, I do think that extreme target, extreme carefulness in targeting does create a lot of problem. It does create errors of exclusion. It does create uh, animosity within the communities. And it does create uh, sometimes uh, uh, not enough political buyout. So you probably don't want to go to the extreme targeting phenomenon. But the uh, purely universal might be, might be hard. Now let me address the question about taxing the top incomes. I think we should. Uh, I mean, right now, it's a time in which probably you might want to have an extraordinary sort of a tax on wealth, a pandemic tax, if you want, on wealth of the very wealthy in the countries, and uh, use this to sort of target particularly the issues that I raised earlier so that you don't leave the poor sectors behind because they were depleting their little human capital that they have, and therefore you condemn them to uh, poverty in the next generation as well. So maybe you, know, you could have a process by which you convince the elites in the country so this is the time to actually uh, put their contribution uh, to a situation that's pretty dire, that doesn't have culprits, and that those of us, I mean, I always say we are also part of the lucky ones. I'm not, you know, in the top 1%, <laughs> but I am, I call, I call myself part of the lockdown lucky uh, and I think all of us here are because we have our wages and we work in a play in, a, in an industry that doesn't require us to risk our health or lives. So we're really part of the lockdown lucky and we all have to show that to, you know, in solidarity. But the very rich in particular have a great opportunity now to show solidarity like probably never before. And I hope that uh, countries move in the direction of actually having this type of extraordinary wealth tax targeted to particularly helping the poor continue their education, be nourished, and uh, not uh, lose the next generation to poverty again. If I may, just one quick interjection. There's one complicating factor. I happen to favor a basic income. Paying for it's the problem, and it's not just whether you tax the super wealthy. No country in Latin America taxes its people as the no, least. No, it does. Die. I mean, the taxes comes in the form of indirect taxes. That's a, that's the issue. All taxes paid by all countries in Latin America 
the most, the highest, according to the World Bank, the highest is Chile, and it's two percentage points below the lowest in the OECD. Latin Americans do not pay taxes. Uh, uh, no, that's not, not entirely. I mean, they, I've been working on this a lot lately, as you know, and it's not, it's very heterogeneous. Brazil and Argentina actually collect taxes and spend close to the uh, sort of OECD countries, and they're not necessarily being very effective or efficient with uh, those uh, collections and spending. You mentioned efficiency. I was just... No, 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 but I'm saying, you know, the size of the state of those two countries compares to the advanced countries. Uh, the, I, I also don't think it's fair to compare Latin America middle-income countries that have 10,000, 14,000 PPP uh, income per capita with countries that are 40,000. If you look at how much the countries that today are in the advanced country group raised of taxes when they had the size of our countries, they raised much less, even much less than we are raising now. So we have to be careful about what are, when, you, when we make that comparison, I think I, I, don't, I don't agree with that comparison. Latin America has middle income countries have to be compared with middle income countries. Within middle income countries, Latin America is very heterogeneous. You have Guatemala, which is a disaster because it doesn't want to raise any taxes to help its poor. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of racism there. And you have Argentina and Brazil that probably tax too much. So that's one thing. The second thing is where do the taxes come from? They come primar primarily from indirect taxation. Direct taxation is the one that's very low in the region. And in particular, we know that top incomes are not paying their fair share. And that's why I was saying that it's very important to bring this to the, to the fore now and uh, use probably an extraordinary wealth pandemic tax to help uh, deal with it. the huge challenges that uh, I barely outlined a little, a little while ago. A universal basic income, however, that is sufficiently generous is not going to be able to be paid just by taxing the rich. Okay? So somebody else will have to pay more taxes than now. And that part of that will be the middle class. And that's, uh, that's, that's why I was outlining what the, what the trade-offs are when you talk about a UBI. Universal basic income. I, I said it in abbreviation, <laughs> which I don't like to use because not everybody is used to the abbreviated version. Okay, so let's see. There's sorry, sorry, Joe, but you know, I've been working on this a lot because you know that's <laughs> what the commitment to X3 Institute does all the time. And you know, I've been writing a lot on the on this issue. But it's yeah. an interesting discussion. We should have it maybe maybe you should have a discussion on the UBIs at some point. Yes. Um, well, I think the, the question that it speaks to, and, and a question just came here again, is to what extent it's, um, I'm jumping a question from Alan. Alan, I didn't forget your question, but the question, just since it's so much on this point, is how much is the pandemic, crisis can be opportunities, crisis can be moments for great leadership, dramatic change in society. Um, we're seeing that right now in the U.S. with the protests that are going out in the streets and um, so crises, can, sometimes there's high tragic costs for the pandemic, but it can be a galvanizing force for change. Um, and the question that MVD is asking is, will the is the crisis going to trigger real change in South America? Which is, is it more probable that countries will learn from the crisis responding to their existing weaknesses now revealed by the pandemic, or will countries just try to forget the trauma and return to the previous normality. So how, how do you see that playing out? Thinking about also our history because crises are nothing new to us. We, we have a lot of those in our past. So it's a, it's a movie that we've uh, lived, but probably not as dramatic yeah. as this one. I think health-wise, if I may, I mean, I'm not gonna speak about the politics. I, I mean, I think Joe is the expert there. Health-wise, what we've seen is that countries that have experienced a previous epidemic that is uh, severe are much better in dealing with this shock. Even one thing that I've been, I've been, I'm, I'm working also with sub-Saharan African countries, and there are examples of exemplary responses in countries that are very, very poor. For example, Uganda, until recently, I don't know if that changed, had zero deaths and very few cases. 
uh, when you ask people there what, 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 what's going on, well, they have protocols that they learn from the Ebola outbreaks. I mean, they, they're trained to deal with this type of adverse shocks. They take them seriously and they implement the policies very quickly. So I think that uh, the same thing in East Asia, the, the reason why we see that South Korea and Singapore and others responded uh, quickly and well, if you ask them, they were you know, <laughs> subject to the other SARS and uh, the, 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 the MERS and I don't know what, what else, but SARS and MERS were sufficient to actually get people uh, very aware that this had to be contained right away. I think that health-wise, we're going to learn. Even in this country, I think we're going to learn that you have to be prepared for next time around because I don't think people want to go through something like this again. In other respects, I am not sure what's going to come out. I don't know if something better will come out of this. Uh, we may end up with something worse, but I'm going to let uh, you know Joe and, and Arachu uh, ponder on it <laughs> if they want to. <laughs> I'm more pessimistic. Um, as I said in my presentation, COVID did not create problems in Latin America. It exacerbated existing problems. So the question, uh, to take Nora's question and sort of invert it a little bit, the question is, of those problems now exacerbated, how can we expect after the pandemic that the region will either learn a lesson because and frankly, as I indicated, I'm very pessimistic. Are we going to make Latin America less unequal? I think, yeah, for yeah, effect, yeah. in the short term, we're likely to see cash transferred. Uh, where will that money come from? She and I will have our conversation about tax policy on another occasion. But the money has to come from somewhere. Uh, and uh, the multilaterals, the so-called IFIs, the international financial institutions, have money and will lend it. Uh, the Africans, by the way, the African uh, response is state-led. Uganda has its own, but there is the African Union has responded in a multilateral manner with European help. And uh, yes, they've done a, uh, as a region, they've done much better um, in cooperating than has Latin America. Uh, I'm not optimistic that anyone's going to wake up the day after tomorrow and say, oh my goodness, I learned this, that, and the other thing from the pandemic, and it'll never happen again, and I'm, I'm going to have a computer in every child's hand, laptop in every child's hand so I can have online teach, and so on. I don't see specific things like that happening. I can see health systems re get restored, some of the budget that was cut over the last 15 to 20 years, um, but other than that, I don't see any, any radical changes that six months from now, 12 months from now, Latin America is going to be so different, you'll never recognize it. I don't believe so. Well, I'd like to add that um, what I'm seeing is that the countries that are responding well to the pandemic are taking note of how they are getting reorganized to respond and uh, are incorporating those uh, lessons into improving the effectiveness of the current systems. Of course, the problem is that few countries are having an effective response. And um, however, we have several countries in the region which um, have denied the need to respond and therefore they won't, therefore they won't have also any motivations to learn from the experience. However, there are some that are actually um, really paying attention from an equity perspective to deal with the pandemic and, uh, and they are incorporating as they do the lessons that are learned. And uh, I, I can think of um, Cuba and Costa Rica as being two of those countries. We still don't, um, it's too early to know about some other parts of the region. But um, just as a, as a reminder, I forgot to show my last slide, but actually the cumulative number of cases in the region is led by Brazil, Peru, Chile, Mexico. Those, all those four countries have more than 100,000 confirmed cases. And, um, 
And in the case of Peru, even though they took measurements very quickly, it hasn't worked out as expected. And, um, but I do think that there will be an effort to understand why the measurements haven't worked out. Um, of course, there are issues that are, that are um, hard to plan, which is the fact that the greatest uh, outbreak in Peru is in Iquitos, where there's a large indigenous community. And what the pandemic is doing, among other things, is reflecting the existing inequity. And also Nora mentioned earlier racism in Guatemala, but racism is prevalent throughout the region and uh, that determines how public policy is developed and implemented. And um, the fact that indigenous communities in the region are the ones that are living in greatest poverty and therefore the pandemic can affect them even more. So I'm not surprised, it's not that a country, when a country implements measures, they cannot revert decades and centuries of racism all of a sudden. Um, so it's harder to, to respond to those. So that could explain part of the problem in Peru also. Um, so the last question, because I feel we're, we've, we've been, we've, we've been, we're almost at uh, two hours of, of the panel. So we're, let's, let's just take this last question so we don't ignore Alan, uh, who's been patient, sent his question first in the chat and then in the questions. He's asking um, if the panelists can make any predictions about what will happen in Nicaragua and Venezuela, um, and specifically if the governments of Ortega and Madura will survive the pandemic. But I guess the question is, in general, do you see any countries at risk of really having a collapse? Um, Argentina has entered moratorium. Um, there's been a, a couple of countries where there's been collapses in the in the health system, at least in some regions of the country. So are we at risk of collapse in the region in any country? And then um, to take Alan's question is, what about Venezuela and Nicaragua specifically? I mean, by collapse, if you mean like, uh, we know there's going to be severe contractions in GDP, uh, whether by collapse is meant an economic implosion and the sort of uh, leaders being overthrown or leaders taking a much stronger stance in order to survive. Uh, I guess, you know, one of the candidates is Venezuela, uh, obviously. But uh, I am not an expert, and I have always followed uh, a rule <laughs> throughout my life. I don't speak on countries that I don't know, so I'm not going to comment. Sorry. Joe, do you want to, or Aracho, do you want to answer Ellen's question? First, I will repeat what has become my litany. Um, Argentina's default did not begin with the pandemic. In fact, the conditions of its emergence from default may improve slightly thanks to the pandemic, but that's another story. Uh, as to you know, what countries are in danger of collapse, I, I don't see any specifically. Um, there are several in very bad shape, but they were before. Um, Honduras' public health system is being kept alive, one of the w w few places the United States has sent aid. Um, uh, Nora has correctly, in my view, I, I agree completely with what she said about Guatemala, and Rachu keeps naming Cuba and Costa Rica for doing good things right. They were the number one and two public health systems in the region before the pandemic. And it's grateful but not surprising that they avoid. Uh, what will happen in Venezuela? Um, I'm following it as closely as you can without going to Caracas. And um, the consensus among those in Caracas and outside Caracas is that Maduro is going to hold on to power. If anything, his control over the government, over the state, has become 
stronger um, in the last 90 days. But again, it's partly a function of the fact that the so-called opposition, uh, the um, uh, Guaido, who's recognized by 55 countries around the world as the legitimate president of the country, has lost his voice, if I can use that metaphor. So I don't see Maduro going anywhere um, unless the gold runs out. Um, he's been spending the country's gold at a rapid rate, but now Iran is bringing in oil. So I don't see him going anywhere in the short to medium term. There was a movement in Latin America called the Grupo de Lima uh, back about five years ago, uh, which reached a consensus to force a diplomatic and peaceful transition. That's disappeared. There's a group led by um, Norway, uh, which meets periodically in, actually not in Norway, they meet in Barbados, uh, and they haven't met and done anything serious. So no, I don't see Maduro going anywhere. Noriega is another thing. I just finished a short S opinion piece about him. I think he's gone nuts. I really do. I think he's lost it. Um, he'll be, will he be replaced by Murillo, his vice president? Um, that's the most likely intermediate term transition in Nicaragua, in my view. There's no external pressure to get rid of him. Venezuela doesn't send him oil anymore, so there's no external pressure supporting him. Uh, but uh, the opposition is um, ensconced in San Jose, Costa Rica, for the most part. And there's very little activity inside the country within the very limited political space Ortega has left them uh, so that I can see something happening there. As I say, he may just get tired. He literally stayed, he self-quarantined for the first 30 days of the COVID pandemic in Nicaragua, literally didn't come out of the house. Um, and will he get tired of it? I don't know. I don't know. He's made uh, his entire family rich. You know, why doesn't he just take his 30 or 40 million and go to Havana? He'll have to take a small group with him. That's the only problem with the Will the Cubans take in 30 or 40 Nikas? I have no idea. But anyway, short answer to the question is highly unlikely that regime transition or regime change will occur in the next six to three to six months. Arachu, do you want to talk to that point? Um, not, not to that question. I've worked uh, in both Venezuela and Nicaragua on health. Um, primary health care and um, on the health system but um, I um, I try to understand to follow the news I do think that the impact would be different in each country because of the level of support from the population uh, seems different to me so I don't know in Nicaragua how long the uh, stronghold can remain. But um, from the, the point of view of the response, in the public health response, the news are not positive, definitely. And uh, the fact that the Pan American Health Organization has is trying to, um, to collaborate with the Nicaraguan government and um, trying to, to support if necessary, but uh, the it's been hard for PAHO also to collaborate with the government of Nicaragua. Ortega refused to allow uh, the representative entrance into the country. He wouldn't talk to him. And it's interesting because the PAHO office in Nicaragua is inside the Ministry of Health. So that's a difficult situation. It's such a hard way to end a wonderful conversation. <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to end with any closing remarks, um, last comments that you want to make. Well, there were a couple other questions that I yes. tried to answer at least partially in the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to mention anything about that, about the questions. So there, I saw a couple of other questions. The last question was about the environment. Um, I think that that's one that we maybe might have missed. 
um, there was a question from Manuel Urbina that was, he was talking about the environment. And uh, he's saying, motivantes y concretas las tres presentaciones felicidades. La crisis que la pandemia está dejando en los ambientes de la salud, el económico, el social y político y el ambiental es mayor por los determinantes sociales. ¿Cómo se logrará que los gobiernos de Latinoamérica incrementen el PIB público en las políticas y programas sociales en lo ambiental? So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on the environment in their, in their last kind of remarks and, and that will we'll close. I, I don't, um, I, I'm interested in knowing actually an answer to the question, but I, I don't have a, a response to that. Nora, Joe? Not my field. I'm, I, I'm religiously <laughs> observing. <laughs> No, I don't have an opinion sincerely. You know, yeah. Before the pandemic, it's one of the few areas in which I found official multilateralism, uh, particularly led by Chile. Chile is going to be um, free of fossil fuels probably before any other country in the region, and they've made that a public policy. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it's policy before the pandemic. So um, I'm not sure what the impact of COVID will be on the environment. Um, Bolsonaro has actually accelerated permits to burn the rainforest during the pandemic because he felt he, uh, the country, the world was distracted. And when he tried to do that um, about six months ago before the pandemic, he got Mr. Macron in, uh, in France very angry. So they had a testy exchange. Um, I think Macron is probably busy um, and Bolsonaro is right, everybody's distracted. But I don't see any conversation anywhere in the region that's caught press or media response about linking, somehow linking the effects of the pandemic to climate or environmental policy. It will continue and those interested in it after the pandemic hopefully will return with more energy to deal with our unchanged and deteriorating environmental issues. Great. Well, it's been a, a wonderful, super valuable and, and very thought provoking conversation. It, you've given us a lot for us to think about and, and to talk about and ponder. So I wanna thank Aracho, I wanna thank Nora and Joe. Thank you for generously joining us today. And thank also everyone who's joining us online. And remind everyone uh, also that uh, this, we're very, very thankful to Tulane University for the sponsorship of this panel and for helping us to publicize, especially to the Center for Inter-American Policy and Research at Tulane University. Um, so please, uh, thank you very much to everyone. And uh, we look forward to continuing to follow the region and hopefully to, to see good news uh, emerging, but also difficult times for the region as this panel has really underscored and conversations that we're gonna need to continue to, to take place and research that we're gonna need uh, to be advanced. So we really thank all three of you for advancing those research agendas and helping us to, to pay attention to the issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lorena. And it was a pleasure to share the stage with Arachu and Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Good Ciao. night to everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night to the participants and Good night. attendees. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.